Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So yeah, I do want to just apologize in advance if I start coughing. Uh, we've been fighting a cold for the last week and a half, so that's why we are wearing masks. The family's here. We're all having a, a good time passing that around to one another. Luckily, we only start coughing when we talk, so we're good with that part. So, All right. Uh, C.S. Lewis famously claimed that the deepest longings of the human heart are hints and echoes of the same things that God wants for us. Think about a fish wrapped up or washed up on a beach, he says. It longs to be back in the water because that's its natural element. And many times in our lives, we too, if we find ourselves yearning for something, it's because we as well have been thrown out of our natural element. But sometimes what we fail to realize, he says, is is that our longings are often reflections of what God, our creator, desires for us. So our desires reveal what we are made for. So what do you do with that? Right? It's great. Uh, Well, it's going to lead us into our scripture today, and that is from Isaiah 55, which we did uh, do a few verses on that, as you know. Isaiah 55 is the last chapter in what is called the second book of Isaiah. So Isaiah has three books kind of broken apart. Um, And so this particular series of books goes chapter 40 through 55. It's called Second Isaiah. Um, And in the second part of this book, Babylon has become this great power has destroyed Jerusalem and taken many of its people captive, and that happened in 597 and 587 BCE. And so these chapters are likely written during Israel's exile in Babylon. Um, and so it, it includes passages that are poetic in nature, passages of hope that, uh, as well, and it has descriptions of the suffering servant, which you might hear a little bit about during Lent. Well, this voice of Isaiah, who's speaking on behalf of God, preaches words of comfort, promising that God is going to bring back the exiles. It's preaching that God is going to bring release to to these exiles. And, of course, this does end up happening in 538, when the Persian ruler Cyrus allows the Jewish exiles to return home. And so those exiles return, and a reestablishment of this new life in Jerusalem happens, and that's kind of the final part of the book in chapters 56 through 66. This talks a little bit about that. So just a little bit of a background of Isaiah But this part that we hear about in in 55 is great to hear during Lent because it serves as an invitation to us all who are seeking God. And this is a very intentional time that we are seeking. Isaiah speaks the words of God. He allows us to understand a little bit more about who God is and what God wants for us and what our wants if they align with his. And so that's kind of our backdrop for today. So I'm going to encourage you to have your Bibles open. I know Facebook's working, but YouTube is not. If you have your Bibles open to Isaiah 55, and even if you're here and you brought your own, I um, encourage you to kind of read along with me. Now, with the caveat that some of these translations are a little bit different, right? We have different translations of our Bible. Uh, we use the NIV, the New International Version, all right? And so if you're going to follow along, I'd ask you to remember two things as we hear those verses. How would a captured people who cannot free themselves, hear these words? And then how do we, as a people who are captured by sin, cannot free ourselves, right? How do we hear these words today, too? So I encourage you to kind of listen, see what these words speak to you. And we're going to begin in verse 3. The prophet Isaiah says, Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. He's speaking on behalf of God. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. So there's a lot there, but hopefully you heard some echoes, right? And I'm going to share with you some of what I'd heard. Basically, hearing that, I hear the word of God. Saying, if you trust me, if you allow me to leave, if you do everything on my behalf and on behalf of my kingdom, I will remain faithful to you and your people as I did to David. And because of that trust, you will be a witness to those around you. People will come to you, flock to you because of your witness to who I am. So Isaiah is sharing this word basically to a people who are struggling with exile. They're stuck. They have no control over their lives. They're feeling abandoned. And yet that promise is still there. If you let me lead you, you will regain the glory of God in your lives and in the lands. And so if we allow God to lead us, 
If we let go of the control in our lives, we can unleash him to a people that need him as well. So then Isaiah continues with what sounds like a sense of urgency, even, with these same people that he's proclaiming God's word to. He says in verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. So you get a sense of urgency. Seek the Lord while he can be found. The prophet is is calling on them to seek now, right? Seek him now. There's an urgency to this. And it's not really like a New Year's resolution kind of urgency, right? I'll do it on January 1st. I'll stop smoking or lose some weight. No, this is something that has to do with immediacy, something that's very important right here, right now, because it's bigger than losing weight. It's a life changer, right? It's a wholeness approach when we allow God to lead and to seek him now. Now, it's not just that God is hidden and can only be found now. It's something that he can only be found when our hearts are inclined to look for him. So do that now is what he's sharing. That inclination, though, is nothing that we can do on our own. It's a gift from God as well through the Holy Spirit. So we receive that gift. We open the gift. We make the most of it while we have it. And frankly, not seeking, failing to call upon him while he is near, means that we're not even going to have a chance at receiving any blessings that God might have for us. But we know we're a, a humanity. Humanity is a stubborn people. We're a people that want what we want, and we have a hard time letting God lead us. We see it in our everyday lives. Uh, do you remember that bumper sticker? I haven't seen one lately on the cars that said, God is my co-pilot. Remember that one? I might have even had one. I don't know. And I get it. It's an acknowledgement that God may be navigating our way. Maybe he's our GPS, if you will. But ultimately... Co-pilot means that we're still driving, right? We're still in control. And so if God is your co-pilot, you can still drive the car to wherever you want to go. You can just take God along for the ride, you know, for guidance. But even if you do want to just keep God as your co-pilot, the windows are probably down, the radio is blaring, the kids are screaming, the air isn't working, it's 100 degrees outside, food all over the cushions, whatever. That's called distracted driving, Right? And so while the distractions are ruling the day, that's when it's the time to step back and say, all right, God, I need a little bit more than a co-pilot, right? You let go and you let God lead. Letting go of that non-productive busyness in life and giving time for God. But even if God is still your co-pilot, that's fine. But guess what? God wants us to switch seats. Switch seats. God doesn't want to be the co-pilot. He wants complete control over the car over the braking and the steering, the AC, the windows, everyone that's in the car. God isn't the co-pilot. He wants to drive the car and get you to where he wants you to be because it's better than where you want to go, all right? And folks, there's so many verses in God's word that tell us to simply just let go of control, to let God lead us. Uh, Many of you, I know you like this when I see it on your Facebook pages and on Instagram, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, right? A lot of you probably even have it memorized. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper for you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Another popular one is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. We're going to touch on that here again in just a minute. These aren't cute little one-liners that we make art out of and hang on our walls or magnets that go on the fridge. These are God-breathed words that help us live, that can be etched in our hearts so that no matter where life is taking us, we know that God is leading us. And that includes the good times, the bad times, the happy and sad, all of those times. And what happens when you do that is shown to us in Isaiah 26, verse 3. You will keep perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. It doesn't just help us get through. It gives us a sense of peace when we let go and let God. Now, there's many more verses as well, right? But every time I think of these verses, how we're to humble ourselves before God and let God lead, I'm really reminded of an encounter I had years ago. It was in... uh, at one point where I was in my pastor training before I was pastorized, um, I was serving as a chaplain at Riverside. <laughs> three of you, thanks. Um, 
I was serving as a chaplain at Riverside Hospital, Methodist Hospital, in a step-down unit. And I happened to be in the chapel one day, and a young lady walked in. Um, she simply wanted to just come in and pray. That happens a lot in, in chapels. And so we did. But during that conversation, I noticed that she had Proverbs 16.3 tattooed on her arm. All right? The whole verse. And here's what the verse said, because I remember this clearly. It says, commit your actions to the Lord, and your plans will succeed. All right? Now, without offending her, I hope, I asked her, I said, now if we're done praying, have, have all of your plans come to fruition? Have you succeeded in everything you've done? Of course, she said no. And she said it bothers her that it hasn't happened. She goes, I, I put this tattoo on my arm so that I can be reminded that when I let God lead me, all of my plans will succeed. That was fun, right? Then you ask her, well, what do you mean succeeding in life? What does it mean to you to be a success in life? And she told me those basic things, having a good job, stable finances, and healthy kids. Now, I wasn't going to get into the merits of her theology at that time. That wasn't what we were here for. Because those are American success pieces, but those aren't necessarily God's success. But it did open up a conversation for us. Because we were able to then talk about how we're committing our actions to the Lord and what that does mean. Because here's the thing. I also knew that verse 16.3. It's one I use in my own personal faith journey. But my version was a little bit different. That's why I alluded to different versions of the Bible that we use, different interpretations that we use. And I want us to simply understand how different translations can really affect our theology and our thinking. So the verse she had tattooed on her arm was what was called the New Living Translation. It took me a little bit to find it after that time. But it's the NLT, all right? It's a popular version, but it's more of a paraphrase uh, from that standpoint, much like the message. It is important to read other translations to make sure we have a good, well-rounded approach. But in this case, it was worth knowing that most other translations don't align with her interpretation of that, or in the GL, the whatever translation that was, New Living, sorry. In the NIV version, which is the one we typically use, it's the most popular version out there in the world of Christianity, it translates this verse like this. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. See the difference? There's a little nuance there, right? Commit your actions to the Lord, and your, your, you know, your plans will succeed. It's kind of a slippery slope. Not only does it put a lot of pressure on, on what you have to do, but it leaves an expectation that whatever we pray for and commit to God, that he's going to make it happen. And some of this, this cosmic vending machine kind of approach that God is, right? He's going to ensure our plans succeed. Our plans I'm committing to you, God. I got it. I expect my plans to succeed. Here's my dollar. I'm going to put it in the offering. She believed that God will make her successful in all that she does. So strongly that she tattooed it on her arm. But there's a sneaky expectation underlying that theology. That success will come with a faith in God. It's prevalent out there. But friends, it doesn't say worldly success. Right? And here's where we're back to Proverbs 3, 5 again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Not a whole lot about success there. What it does say is that we can carry on through our brokenness by trusting in God. If we lean not on our own understanding, if we give everything to God, it's a lot easier. There are times in our life where we will face trials where we are going to be beyond confused as to why we are going through whatever it is that we're going through. It makes no sense. But it doesn't need to always. We want it to. We want to have all the answers. But the fact is, we see our trials and tribulations and heartbreaks completely different than the way God sees them. So if God is establishing our plans, and we're allowing God to lead our lives... We do it by simply committing to him everything that we do. And yes, then we can count on those plans because they will be God's plans. Understanding, of course, they may not go the way we want them to go. So let's go back to Isaiah 55 again for clarification. And I know I'm kind of like all over the Bible today, but so much of this relates. If you read the Bible, it's like, ooh, that one, da 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 and all comes to it, right? Um, so this is why the word of God can, still continues to lead us day to day. So here's verses 8 and 9 in, in Isaiah 55. 
And this speaks to the big point of who God is. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I want to kind of leave that on the screen too, just so we can kind of really understand the depth of that. God is letting us know who's running the show. Through Isaiah, God is telling the Israelites, God's in control still. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, right? God doesn't act the way we do. He does things as he wants to do them. And his ways many times are not our ways. And so we get into a lot of trouble when we expect that God should act the same way we do. And this is where verse 9 hammers it home. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, how far is the distance between God's thoughts and ours? Right? How far is that distance between heaven and earth? How far is his way different than ours? I mean, that's a big distance between heaven and earth, right? Anyone have an image in your mind how big that truly is? But simply hear this. Even as big as you can imagine how far that is, the distance is never going to be too great that God can't overcome it. God will always be God. We will always be his created, his children. But through Jesus, when our salvation is complete and we're united with God in glory at that time, that's when the distance will be completely closed and we spend our life with him. But until then, we have to come to the understanding that God's ways are higher than our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. It's humbling, isn't it? So if we're going to turn our life over to God and turn things over to God, and he truly is leading, we will see God's response. And we will sit and give thanks for whatever the answer is, even if it doesn't align with our wants. I guess the big thing is, is don't let the world have the last word, right? God always gets the last word. Every week we meet together um, as a team for... um, the visitation, we call it a visitation, community care kind of piece, right? There are close to 100 names on our list right now of people that we know that are connected to this community that need prayers. And it ranges from mental illness to, to physical illness, just all kinds of uncertainty out there, right? And so each week we lift them up and we pray. A lot of them are nervous about what's going to happen. And many times our natural inclination is simply to accept the diagnosis of whatever happens. Just accept it, right? Sometimes it feels like it's too much to walk through, and we simply just give up. And perhaps we act that way because we put so much faith in science or or predicting what's going to happen when you get cancer or other diseases. Yes, our bodies react in certain ways from certain diseases. But folks, if you're willing to only let the doctors and science tell you what's going to happen next, then I would offer you another way. Let God lead. There are stories after stories after stories after stories of people who have prayed for miracles. They've placed their trust in God, and God did what God does. He's either removed the cancer or given them new life, breathed into them, and that sickness was gone, whatever it is. During COVID, we saw many miracle stories along these lines. Folks on the edge of death, on ventilators, Their faith continued, and people around them, faith continued to be strong. And they came out of it thanking and praising God. All the while, we lost loved ones because of the virus. And good and faithful people are wondering why their neighbor's wife got to survive, but their son did not. Why? It doesn't seem fair. So yes, if we put it into the expectations of the world, yeah, it doesn't seem fair, right? Why do some people seem to gain the favor of God and others don't? And we're not going to have an answer to that. There's no answer on this side of heaven, except for one. Let God lead. Let God be God. Let go of your expectations and give them back to God. If you want any kind of peace over dealing with that, let God lead. But don't you dare shortchange God, the God who brought back his son from the dead, the God who raised Lazarus, the God who healed lepers, who restored the insane, who fed thousands with two loaves and five fish, the God who created us. Folks, God is a miracle worker. 
And we need people of faith now more than ever to believe that now more than ever. Don't shortchange God just because things aren't working out for us. There may be something better waiting for you. And maybe it's not here on this earth. Maybe it is with him. But we need to pray for that first and foremost. But most of the time we can't see through our eyelids because our eyes aren't open to the power of God. And so we have to seek him while he's near. When you stay around faithful Christ followers long enough, you'll hear those stories. Stories of testimony, stories of of healing, stories of redemption that science has absolutely no, no answer for. And it's amazing and it's renewing and it brings you back to the full understanding of who God is in our life. We need to hear those stories. We need to testify to those if it's happened to us. So people will continue to run like those other countries to us because they want to know more about God. So how do we do that? Of course, it's easy to say it, but it's hard to live it. So let's leave with just a couple of things. And I have kind of an approach that I'm going to kind of offer to that um, that'll hopefully make sense here. Uh, Generally, I have a word of advice for new grooms when I have the honor of officiating a wedding, right? Two rules I usually share with them during the weddings. Number one is, your wife will always be right. Okay? There's a point to this. <laughs> it's hard to believe, I know, but we men would be in a lot better off if we would simply understand our wife is always right. Amen? And all the men said amen. Okay. So that's good advice, right? Here's better advice. Number one, your wife will always be right. Number two, when she's wrong, go back to rule number one. <laughs> right? Don't throw it back at her. Now, that is cute, and of course, here's how we apply this kind of thinking, if you will, to the things that happen in our life as we want to turn them over to God. Think of those two rules, if you will, on a bigger scale. But even if your spouse is your whole world, God bless you, but God created the world, so he created your spouse, and so this is the approach we will still take. Number one, spend time in your Bible. All right? Don't just read it once. Move and just move on, but study it until it becomes as natural as breathing. It's a part of who you are. It's a part of your routine. It's why it's called the spiritual discipline study. It takes us deeper in our trust and in our relationship with God and his son. And number two is pray. Pray and keep on praying. Ask people you know that are believers to join you in prayer. Be open and vulnerable before the one who created us, knowing that he is faithful and has our best interests in mind. Number three, find people who are strong in faith. Christians that are going to speak godly wisdom into your life. It's hard enough to live in this world without any support, right? So don't isolate yourself, but align yourself with people who align themselves with God's word. The ones who want to lead their life as we do. And then number four, basically stop pushing forward in your own strength. Let go, and either God will work it out and open a door, or he won't. But in the meantime, go back to the first two rules until you get an answer. Listen until you get an answer. Read, pray until you get an answer. Always go back to rules number one and two, word and prayer. Our longings to be in control are always going to be in the forefront. But God, who is faithful and just, wants nothing but the best for us. But like a loving parent, sometimes we don't know for ourselves what is in our best interest. So this week, I'd encourage you to find something in your life, something that's gone sideways, something you're struggling with, and just let go. Get into God's word. Pray like you've never prayed before. Surround yourself with people who would support you, not just on Sunday, but every day. Stop pushing forward on your own, though, and trying to do it alone. Let God have it. Turn it over to him, because he did the same thing for us. He knew we were struggling with sin and death and couldn't do it on our own. So he let go of his only son, sent him to the cross to be a sacrifice for us, because we couldn't do it on our own. Amen? Let's stand and pray. God, as we continue to move forward in worship as we sing in response as we come to your table to receive that gift of forgiveness. Help us to leave whatever it is that we are struggling with at your feet. 
Help us to let go of those things that are holding us back from being fully your people and being fully engaged in the kingdom that you have called us to live in. We are still in the world, but we aren't of the world. So help us to remove ourselves when possible to those things that keep us tied down to the world. Surround us with like-minded people that want to follow Christ and see your will be done. Most of all, we want to give thanks for your son. He's on his way to the cross, and we give thanks for that because we know on the other side is that glorious resurrection that we get to celebrate. And because we celebrate that and believe in, in that, that we get to live with you forever, completely and wholly. So we give thanks, we give praise, we give glory, and we do it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.